104.5, the team, your home for New York sports. Thanks to our friends at Mohawk Army Navy. Field Yates with us right now. Last week, Field, I said, Matt Patricia's the, the coach of the Giants. You went, you pulled the lead course on me, not so fast. Now, hey, Field, Pat Shermer's the coach of the Giants. Are, are we right this time? This one, I think we can say, all right, guys, this is the way that it is trending. Now, until things are official, nothing is officially official. But barring a last-minute surprise, a last-minute snag, the Giants are going to go with Pat Shermer as their head coach. Now, they still have a couple more boxes they want to check in the process of going through their candidates, but it's obvious that at this point of the year, given that NFL teams cannot hire coaches that are still coaching until after their season, that the Giants and the Colts and the Lions and perhaps the Cardinals as well and uh, you know, really all five vacancies, the Titans obviously a more recent vacancy, they're just waiting for the conclusion of the coveted assistance in their respective seasons. So, yes, Pat Shermer will be the next head coach of the New York Giants, barring something entirely unforeseen. Do you, do you like the higher field? You know, I always have this conversation with people because – you know, I had someone who's a huge Giants fan tell me, well, what's this hire going to be? And I said, no, I have no clue. <laughs> I mean, how do we know, right? I mean, like, so I always think that the best way to assess coaching hires is this. Retroactively. It's like draft grades. But I understand that the nature of the society we live in is not one where we can retroactively grade or assess, um, you know, sort of a, a forecast of, of, the, of a coach's outlook. So here's what I would say. Here are the things that I would believe the Giants need in a head coach after firing Ben McAdoo, a coach that is prepared to handle multiple different circumstances. Like when you're hiring somebody for the Rams job last year, it's obvious. You're hiring somebody that needs to be able to groom Jared Goff. Sean McVay was an absolute grand slam hire, obviously. And Sean could have been good in a lot of different games, but it was very clear what the Rams needed. Now in the Giants, uh, hiring, you're going to need somebody who is, A, equipped to handle Eli Manning, potentially for one more year, or B, handle Eli Manning being phased out as soon as this year, or C, Eli, Eli Manning not even being phased out, but just straight up cut and moving on to the number two overall pick in the draft, which presumably would then be a quarterback. So by the line of thinking that Pat Shermer has dealt with a lot of different quarterback variables this year, specifically losing his starter in week two of the season, Sam Bradford, and making Case Keenum one of the best quarterbacks in football. Yeah, I think he checks a lot of the boxes for the Giants. You brought up Case Keenum right there. Now Giants fans will start to wonder, all right, Shermer's on the move. Keenum's a free agent. Is it out of the possibility that Keenum could actually be a Giant next season? I don't think so. Uh, Entirely out of the possibility, no. But I do think it's probably less likely I think the end result for Case Keenum is probably that he gets franchise tagged, right? I mean, how could you possibly not franchise tag Case Keenum right now? And I say that, and people are going to say, well, you know, it's small sample size. Still got Teddy Bridgewater, still have Sam Bradford. Uh, both of those guys are scheduled to be free agents as well. And keep this in mind um, in terms of cap commitments for next year, if you look at the teams that have the five lowest cap commitments on the books, we're talking about teams like the Indianapolis Colts and the Cleveland Browns and the San Francisco 49ers. And then at number five is the Minnesota Vikings because they don't have any of those three quarterbacks under contract beyond this season. So using the franchise tag on Case Keenum, not only is probably sensible, it's probably financially palatable for the Vikings. The question just becomes this, I think, for Minnesota. you know, How much do you value Matt on a per-year basis on a multi-year deal? This is all a roundabout way of saying, I don't think he's going to end up in New York with the Giants. Field Yates with us right now. Thanks to our friends at Mohawk Army Navy on 104.5 The Team. Uh, Field, the Eagles have just latched on to this underdog thing. They, you know, over 500 masks bought off of Amazon. The local stores can't keep the dog masks on the shelves. Have you seen something like this, and how far do you think it can propel them? I'm trying to think of something that sort of rivals this in terms of the underdog in a literal sense, right? (laughs) Um, We've seen phenomenons for sure, and we certainly have seen things that have buzzed and things that have uh, become, you know, noteworthy uh, in the, you know, the realm of sports. I don't know that I can think of a perfect comparison though to draw between this current Eagles underdog situation and another team that we've seen. And you know, people, I'm sort of one of those. I guess I have a uh, an ounce of curmudgeon in me, and I think to myself, like, no team that's playing in the conference championship is really truly considered an underdog in my book. 
Now, that being said, the Philadelphia Eagles also were given very little chance by a lot of people to win that game last week against the Atlanta Falcons, despite a 13-3 and record, despite the fact that the Falcons have been up and down throughout much of the season. So if this is what it takes emotionally for the Eagles to uh, get into the mindset they feel like is optimal, then I, I have no problem with it. Like, I don't have a problem with teams feeling that way. I think that on the outside, though, like, we need to, as the media, like, we don't need to be talking about the Eagles as, in, as if they have no chance. They can say it themselves, but of course the Eagles have a chance. Best team in football, uh, at least in the NFC throughout the season, very good roster top to bottom, and they're playing at home. On that other side of it, it's the AFC. It's the Patriots hosting the Jacksonville Jaguars. And it almost seems like Jacksonville has always felt like this underdog story, people not giving them credit. If Jacksonville could somehow pull off this upset, what would they have to do in this game? You know, let's say this is I think that, you know, this, and, and a lot of the things that I think it will take for Jacksonville to win are obvious. And I'm not trying to say I haven't sort of like thought about this or sunk my teeth into this game. It's more just like the Patriots are so talented, they're so disciplined that the things that it takes to beat them are often pretty fundamental. Uh, turnover battle. Can you generate pressure against Tom Brady uh, with just four rushers? Because if Tom Brady sees a favorable matchup, you know what he's thinking, guys. He's thinking, you know, I'm, I'm going right there, whether it's Gronk on a linebacker, whether it's a running back on a linebacker, heck, whether it's James Devlin, their fullback in the passing game. Like, Tom Brady is the master the best ever, perhaps, at finding those matchups and exploiting them. But I think that getting home with four rushers is probably important for Jacksonville. And then is there any way they can provide a little bit of resistance in the red zone to the Patriots' offense? Tom Brady, there are 29 red zone touchdowns this year. That was the most in the NFL. He had zero interceptions. Nearly flawless in the red zone was Tom Brady. And as we saw last week at the end of that Philly game, like it's not easy always to operate offensively in the red zone. Uh, it's congested space. The number of route concepts that you can um, you know, actually dive into is, is sort of limited. So I think if the Jaguars can disrupt the Patriots a bit in the red zone, that'll help them quite a bit uh, to win this game on Sunday in Foxborough. Field, have you heard anything about the, the hand injury for Brady that would lead you to believe it would be a factor this weekend? Uh, I would say this is I think there's two different buckets. The first one is, is it going to impact his ability to be on the field? I think we're pretty comfortably past the point of that being a question. No, it's not going to build, uh, prevent Tom Brady from being on the field on Sunday. Is it going to impact him? Like, I don't know how you could say with certainty, like, no, it's not going to impact him at all. It's a throwing hand. Of course, you know, like, he's going to potentially grip the football 70 times on Sunday afternoon, right? That's about an average number of plays and offense runs per game. So it could impact him. Um, you know, I don't think the Patriots um, are – entirely concerned that their offensive operations are going to have to be reshaped, but certainly it's something to keep an eye on as we get closer to Sunday. Field Yates brought to you by Mohawk Army Navy. All right, next time we talk, who do you think will be representing the AFC and the NFC in the Super Bowl? I think we're going to be talking about the Patriots going to Minnesota to play the Vikings. Uh, that is a we, we do this insiders bracket each week on ESPN.com, and it's overviewing who we think will win each game. We've been projecting it all the way to the Super Bowl each week. So my ultimate picks were the Vikings and the Patriots. Now I've missed a couple games along the way in the playoffs, but at this point, I don't think I can deviate from my pick of the Patriots and the Vikings, uh, given the fact that they're still in it. Uh, you know, Minnesota is a team that's going to have to overcome the emotional impact of playing in Philadelphia. You know that crowd is going to be out of control, excited, uh, and thrilled about their squad, but I do think the Vikings find a way. All right, Field, man, we appreciate you. Enjoy the uh, championship round. All right, guys, thanks so much for having me on.